Well, Pastor Matt has asked me to uh, speak today. I haven't done this in like two years before Nahani actually even came on the scene. And um, uh, I really, really appreciate the opportunity that he's given me um, to speak. Uh, where do we rely on technology? So, oh Lord. Um, he had a special request though. He asked me to give my testimony. So I'm gonna work my testimony into the word today. Uh, just bear with me if I ramble or I'm nervous or, you know, just don't say the right thing or they come out the right way. Praise the Jesus. Oh, come on. Give them to you. Thank you. Thank you for working. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, if you don't know me, I'm Yvette. My name is Yvette Lusto. I'm married into the House of Lustos, the many Lustos. Um, and I'm so blessed to be married into this family because they love the Lord, they understand the word, and they have a desire to serve Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, like I do, and my family. So I grew up in a Christian home, and I got saved when I was 12 years old in a um, kids' church, much like our kids' church. We had a small little kids' church with a portable building in the back. And um, another Bible school student from who was from the Bible school that I also went to, and Christopher and, and Josh and my own sister went to, um, had an altar call. Her name is Christina, I hope she's watching today. Um, we had an altar call, and it was like a little mini altar, much like this, and um, all the kids came up, and we lifted our hands, and we were on our knees, and um, we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, accepted Jesus into our hearts, um, and then we were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'll never forget that night. It was on a Wednesday night. Um, like I said, we were in a portable building, as some others who have had children's church or youth group have been in a portable at some time in their lifetime. Um, and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget all the kids around me, all of us speaking in tongues, all of us having the power of the Holy Spirit gifted to us by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And just what an awesome moment in our lives as kids. Um, but sometimes as kids, we don't really <laughs> understand what we're getting into, I think. Um, there's got to be foundation, you know? So, so you have to be able to understand this submitting to who God is and who Jesus is and what his plans are for our lives. And as kids, I don't think we really got that. But I had a really good teacher and my dad. We had a lot of great pastors and preachers and word givers throughout the years. I saw many miracles, signs and wonders at our church, but my dad was always the one who brought the word to us, you know, facts. He, he taught us about the tribulation. He taught us about the cross. He taught us about, you know, the different Bible stories. And, you know, the Bible wasn't some rinky dink uh, book. It was so. It was a treasure of knowledge for him, and it still is. So, my message today is going to be from a submission to servanthood, and my testimony um, on how I became a servant of the Lord. Uh, let's see. Oh, once again, technology has overtaken me. Let's see. Is it here? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm just kidding, we're not going there. But in the beginning, I told you um, that my dad was the one who really taught us the word of God. And his most one of his most favorite quotes is with your children is that you occupy their time or someone else will. And I'm not sure <laughs> how much my dad understood how biblical this was, not just for children, but for us as children of God. Because if we have to have the Lord occupy our time, or the enemy's gonna find a way to occupy our time. So, um, Proverbs 5, 1 through 2, my son, be attentive to my wisdom and incline your ear to my knowledge, my understanding, 
that you may keep discretion and lips may guard knowledge. That's something he always instilled in us is knowledge and wisdom and understanding. He always had the answers. If we come uh, to him with questions about the Bible, he's always got an answer because he always turns to the Bible for the answer. And um, we ought to square our attention to the knowledge of God as children of the Lord. Um, so you see a lot of pictures like this. We went to, to Arizona and took a lot of photos. It was an expensive trip, so I decided to use our pictures because those are some expensive photos. All right. <clears throat> so, um, excuse my nervousness. You know, sometimes when we learn the things of God or, or in my own experience, some of that knowledge was never not applied in my life. I, I didn't take it and run with it like I thought it would. I went to Bible school. Um, I, I, after Bible school, I went to regular college. You know, and if you've ever been to college, that college life can overwhelm you and overtake you. Like it can be something that sucks you in, you know, you've got to meet expectations of college. But um, Pastor Matt always this this illustration of how the enemy can put a foothold in your life if you allow him. He, he does, where he goes to the door, remember he goes to the door and he opens the door and he says, he opens the door just a little bit and he sticks his foot in there and he gets really loud and he shuts the door and his foot trying to fight the enemy on the other side from getting in. But sometimes those footholds just widen the door. Um, it's not something to sneeze at when he's making that illustration. That door, it's got to be shut. You got to shut it to the things of this world. We have to shut it so we can be only open to the mind of God. Um, we don't ever want to have the enemy give, have a foothold in our lives. Um, so give no opportunity of the devil, and that's usually the scripture that he points to when we talk about a foothold. <clears throat> so in this opportunity, I want to talk to you about submission to God's voice and that it leads to serving him. And um, like I said, I'm going to mix a little bit of my testimony into the message today because it kind of escalates to how I came here. Um, so opportunities. Oftentimes we hear God opens doors and when he does walk through them. The problem is walking through doors. Like all doors are not created equal. Okay. We got doors over there that swing and they got hinge pins that shut automatically, which we need a couple in the men's room and the ladies room, by the way. And then we got doors that have major locks. You can't get in. There's no lock on the other side. You got to push it from the inside to open it. And then there's doors like Walmart. You just step right in front of them and they open. And they open right up for you. And they open right up for Shelby. And they open right up for anybody who stands in front of it. So we got to watch out for doors. Not all doors are created equal. And some doors lead to empty rooms. So we have to listen to God's voice about the type of doors that we walk into. So not only can the devil have a foothold in your life, if you open the door in your life, you have to walk through the doors that God tells you to walk through. And sometimes we don't really, when we don't have a connection with the Lord, we don't have the ear to hear his voice. And at that time in my life, I didn't have a connection with the Lord. I was trying to walk through every Walmart door that opened because those Walmart doors might lead to the success that I had, might lead to my future husband. They might lead to friends. It might lead to knowledge or a title or a car or a house. You know, I wanted it all. <laughs> we can't have it all. Not by the world standards, at least. We can't have it all. Um, like I said, we need to listen to God's voice to the opportunities. But sometimes those opportunities 
are counterfeit doors. And those counterfeit doors create counterfeit opportunities for us. Those counterfeit opportunities can be distracting like they were for me at that time in my life when I just wanted it all. Oh, but watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. Our, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. And sometimes we pray to our flesh and our fresh flesh what it wants. Oh, sometimes our flesh wants a fancy car. Sometimes our flesh wants a bigger house. Sometimes our flesh just wants a party size of Oreos. You know, we just want to go out and get that party size of Oreos and hide them from our husband. That's me, sorry. That's not me. That's me. Um, that was me looking for the most opportune door to walk into. So the Lord never left me though. I heard him. I, he could, I felt the conviction of God. His voice was always there telling me not to do what I wanted to do. Telling me those things that I longed for were not really a part of his will. Yes, I longed for them, but they were not a part of his will. We want to be a part of his will. My selfish ambition led to depression, and my depression led to despair, and my despair led to me looking and seeking for what the world wanted. And, you know, if you find yourself ever seeking for what the world wanted, it's not going to satisfy you. It's not. There's always going to be a longing. And then that longing turns into a flood of emotions. And those flood of emotions turn into drowning, which I felt. Matthew 6, 32 through 33. 33, 32 through 33. For all these things do the, the Gentiles see. Your heavenly Father knows that you have or need all these things. <clears throat> but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I found myself aiming for money, aiming for a husband, aiming for kids, aiming for success. Not in any particular order. My eyes were not fixed on the Lord, but I still long for the days when I was simply happy just to know Him. And happy to hear His word. Galatians 5, 16 also says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. <clears throat> trying to get the hang of this. I'm a techie, I promise. Okay, so his grateful progression to a mended heart. So little did I know that God was trying to mend my heart. I wasn't seeking after him. I still was longing for him, but I wasn't seeking after him. But as long as I was longing for him, he was still trying to reach out to me. So from a place where I felt let down by the body of Christ, um, God made a way for me to be surrounded by the fellowship when I had bitterness in my heart about the church. I had been so far off from church that I didn't even listen to Christian music. I changed the channel. I'd roll my eyes and change the channel. I didn't want to hear about the gospel. I didn't want to hear about K-Love. I didn't want to hear who Chris Tomlin was, by the way. At that time, I didn't know who he was, but apparently he stole every hymn out there. Um... I didn't want to hear any Christianese, guard your heart, you know, type of stuff. I didn't want to hear it. I was bitter to the world or the Christian worldview. But he was still trying to reach me. Um, in the fellowship, he was teaching me that doing it my own way was only frustrating me. Um, that his way is higher than my way. And I started to visit different churches. I went to a Methodist church. I went to a Lutheran church. I went to various little Christian churches. And then I had my sights set on a Catholic church. And the Lord put us out to that right away. He put us out to that Catholic thinking. But I heard it was nice. So I was going to try it out. Um, but then he started to 
He removed those old desires. He removed all those strongholds that I had against Christian where I rolled my eyes and I changed the channel to Kayla to something secular or whatever. Lady Gaga was my thing at the time. There was no Cardi B. <laughs> yeah. They had that star on her face and all the Illuminati logos going on. His way is higher than my way. So God was working. God was working. And I wasn't totally opposed to what God was doing. But I still had that bitterness. You know, sometimes when you do things our way, it still frustrates us, even if our intention and our focus is still on God. Yeah. Um, I'll, <laughs> I used to babysit um, Carter and Shepard, and one day Carter and Shepard had a little kiddie pool, and I had this little red radio flyer wagon with like these little wobbly um, wheels. And I would take them on walks, but this time Carter wanted to go in the grass. She wanted to take that little radio flyer wagon in the grass. And it was summer, so our grass was high. And I told her, I'm not pulling you in the grass. That's too hard, and our grass is not level. And it's a wagon, it's supposed to be on the sidewalk. I kept telling her, um, did I do that? I think I did that. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so, she said, I want to go in the grass. I want to go in the grass. So she loaded Shepard up into the radio flyer wagon in her bathing suit and him and his little trunks and his bottle in his mouth. And she took that radio flyer wagon in the grass and she grabbed that handle and her four-year-old little body tried to pull that wagon through the grass. And you should have seen her. She was all the way to the ground pulling that wagon, trying to have a great time, by the way. And she said, I can't pull this wagon. Come and help me, Missy. You better just come and help me. And I said, I'm not pulling that wagon in the grass. You see how hard it is. And she said, please. <laughs> so I said, fine, jump in the wagon. And she jumped in the wagon. And I started pulling this wagon in the grass. And it was even hard for me. But she looked hilarious in her wet bathing suit and her baby brother inside the radio flyer wagon. And isn't that like us trying to do things in our own way? There you are sitting in your little red wagon in the grass wanting to be to be pulled and go faster but but god has other plans that wagon was meant to go on the sidewalk so it could go faster it's a radio fly so i said this, she said go faster i said i can't go faster so i said we're gonna go the, we gotta go on the sidewalk do you want to go faster or do you want to stay in the grass and she said let's go faster so i took it on the sidewalk and we went for a walk and we went faster See, God has the right path. He doesn't want to drag you in the grass, you know, because you want to do it your way or because we want to do it our way or because I wanted to do it my way, go into a Catholic church. God had other plans. He had a fellowship for me to follow, for us to follow. We have to cherish our fellowship because being around the fellowship is nourishing. So don't be like a little four-year-old in the radio flyer wagon. God wants to take you on the right path. He wants to take you through his will. Amen. Um, so. Did I do that? Okay. Oh, my gosh. I got a new technology. Okay. Next. So. God decided to take action in my life. So the Lord moved me to do more. Some of the things that I did was when I was at church after praise and worship, I went down and I greeted everybody. Every single person was sitting down and not mingling. I shook their hand and I said good morning and I said their name and they felt important. Um, people would tell my mom, I love when Yvette comes to say hello to me on Sunday morning. Even though their anxiety about talking to people was really hard. So I took part in pre-church prayer. Um, it was mandatory for us, but I still had a choice. So I went to pre-church prayer and it was part of that fellowship of nourishing what God wanted me to do. I was praying for others. When somebody told me they had an ailment at church, I would pray for them. And then I was volunteering for various activities and 
I didn't want to because all of those activities involve things that I usually got paid for, um, like painting children's faces. It's not easy to paint a child's face on a hot summer day, but I did it. Um, Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to serve one another and love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some by encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is drawing near. The day is drawing near. Jesus is going to come. He's coming soon. We see the signs everywhere. Pastor Matt talks about it on Wednesday nights. The time is coming. We don't want people to be left behind. Can you sit there and see your coworker left behind when Jesus raptures the church? Can you sit there and see your unsaved cousin or aunt or uncle left behind when Jesus raptures the church? That's hard to fathom. It's not a fantasy, it's reality. Um, There's another oh, that's the grand family right there, guys. So pleasing him, he'll give you the desires of your heart if you want to please him. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, but he will give you the desires of your heart, not material possessions. See, when I used to hear that scripture, I used to think, oh, God's going to give me everything I want. But everything I wanted was not what he wanted. So I thought, maybe that means something else. I need new desires because my current desires frustrate me because I can't attain them. He wants to give us new desires. He wants to place, see that word give, to put the desires means to place. He wants to place new desires in your heart. Um, and then pleasing the Lord is my strength and motivation motivation motivisa motivisa um so by this the i didn't put the scripture here but um the joy of the lord is my strength so i really didn't look what the greek meaning is but but my take on it is pleasing the lord is my strength making him happy with what i do is my strength but making with him happy with what I do means that my motivation to please him is solely for him and his purpose. I asked the Lord to remove rebellion in me so I could please him. And rebellion started for me with my tithe. He said, you want to be not rebellious or unrebellious? Tithe. Like a big word in my brain, tithe. You're not going to tell me that it's not okay. I mean, it's okay not to tithe. Uh, he told me to tithe. I tithe, and I tithe faithfully, and God prospered me. Not with wealth. I wasn't swimming in gold. You know, like some of the customers at the bank, they think that, that in the vault in the back, we turn this big wheel and we just dive into the money. <laughs> or that we make the money with those little machines that we count the money with. That's not what happened. Um, so I had to let go of some of the rebellion that I had in my heart. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. See, God rewarded me. I was, uh, well, I went back to the stuff. Oh, so that wasn't in my phone now. You guys enjoying the beer? There you go, there's another one. All right. Um, he also instructed me to serve him. So I started serving the church again. Uh, I was in the praise and worship team, but this time I really meant it when I sang the songs. Like I started singing. I know it sounds funny, but when I was in the praise and worship team, I didn't mean it. I was just singing. I'm like, what am I doing here, Lord? You know, I got on the praise and worship team. The pastor's wife said, I heard you sing. Your dad says you sing. And she handed me a microphone. You want to sing with us? And I was like, oh, okay. And I didn't know a single song. Like I said, I didn't know any praise and worship songs. I had been far from the Lord. 
And I got up there and I just moved my mouth and some music came out of it, but I didn't say any words correctly, but I was part of the crazy worship team. But this time I meant it. So um, I started forming relationship with godly coworkers. The same Christian coworkers that I rolled my eyes at because we're talking in, Christ in Christianese to me. I started forming relationships with them. Um, I started a prayer group at work and started praying for people. Um, and then it turned into a Bible study where we had music and then we had a Bible study and all the student teachers would come and then all the teachers would come and then suddenly the principal came. Um, we need some fellowship with like-minded people because we're not with like-minded people. We start thinking like the unlike-minded people, the people that we're not like. Start liking Lady Gaga again. Gosh, I don't know why I feel like that. Um, I know a blast of music in my car I turned all the way up and it was like Lady Gaga song in my head. Uh, here's some questions to ask yourself if you don't want to be a part of the fellowship or if you have a little, just no desire whatsoever. Do I have a contentious relationship with others? Uh, not spoken to contention is obvious, but silent contention is what we really need to address. Even silent contention means that, that you, you have strife with others without them even knowing it. There can be people they hear that you have strife with and they don't even know that you have strife with them. Your excuse is maybe if I just stay away from that person, the whole situation will be fine. That person might not even know that it's not fine. Do I make excuses? If I'm not around, I won't cause any problems. And that's why it's better for me to stay away. That's also potential strife. Um, am I, I, are you paranoid? Maybe if I, if I'm not invited, it's because they don't like me. You don't know if they don't like you if you don't if you're not around them to know if they don't like you. Um, do I just wish not to socialize because I just don't know who people are? Well, um, how do you get to know them if you're not around them? It's just not who I am to be around people. You're a Christian. You're not supposed to be you. You're supposed to be like Christ. Do you still go back to even the little things in your own life? I'd rather hang out with my old friends than my church family. Because when you come to Christ, these are not just your friends. This is your family. This is your brother and your sister. We are a family now, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Am I still following the same people and the same old habits? Uh, do you still like on the Lady Gaga page, even though you don't follow her anymore? So that's a little bit. Luke 6, 46. Oh, did I do that again? Oh gosh, what's that? Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? By making all these excuses uh, to not be around the fellowship, to not serve him, to not go to the church, and, um, oh gosh, um, and do what to fill the needs of the church, fill the needs of the church people, you're essentially just not doing what the Lord told you to do because God said, do not forsake the fellowship of the believers. We need to be around each other because we're family. Just leave it all to the Lord. Just, just leave it to him. He'll take care of it. But, but you might say, how? Just do it. Just just go to the women's meeting. Just go to the men's breakfast. Just take that little trip, the person who asked you, would you like to ride with me somewhere? Um, let's go to Marshall's and have a girl's day. <laughs> we got you there, huh? <laughs> Let God be God, because he knows what he's doing in your life. He knows what he's doing. Um, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you to? <laughs> <laughs> so biblical Christianity is truth concerning huh. That's cool. That's a good one. 
stop falling. It's the white slide. Biblical Christianity is truth concerning total reality and the intellectual holding of the total truth, and then living in the light of that truth. That was said um, by Francis Schaeffer at Notre Dame in April 1981. So live in the reality of the truth and hold fast to that truth. Fellowshipping, serving the church. We, we must do it or we're gonna become jaded and we're gonna roll our eyes and change that radio. There's no time to waste. Jesus is coming soon. John 9, 4 says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. That means you can't work. Your family can't work. Your unsaved family can't work. Oh, there you go. Oh, we're going to this way. Oh. You change it again. Okay. Look at You pointed at him and he's pointed at <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's not working. Yeah. yeah, there's another slide. When you start to fellowship, um, we start to fellowship with one another, the same spirit will attract. God will bring your life those that can edify you. Um, you must work the works of him who sent me. So, my, one of my favorite authors, Christian authors, is D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was around in the 1800s. You'd be surprised to know that a lot of things in the 1800s have not changed to the 2000s. Um, he talks about a woman. He did crusades. He did uh, tent revivals. A woman who got saved, and then she came back to him. She said, Mr. Moody... Have I feel so dreadful? You know, she wanted, um, she was miserable the whole week after she got saved. Um, and he asked her, What do you have trouble with? Why, why are you miserable? And and she said, I don't, I don't know, I don't understand why I'm miserable. I thought it was supposed to be better because I got saved. And and he said, Um, well, did you tell anybody about Christ? And she said, No, what. She was afraid to tell people about Christ. And he said, then go tell people about Christ. You see, according to D.L. Moody, she wanted the crown of salvation, but she didn't want to carry the cross. She wanted to be saved, but she didn't want to tell people that she was saved. And she wanted to tell other people how they could get saved. So one day he was holding another crusade. 8,000 men showed up and only one woman. It was that same woman, and she sat right next to her husband. And she said, I told my husband, and he wants to become saved. So he read the Bible to her, to her husband, and he became saved. And she said, I'm not miserable anymore, because my husband is now saved, and we can both tell people about Christ. See, when we create atmospheres of like-minded like -minded people, because we're obedient to the word of God, we're less miserable. <laughs> Trust me. Test it. Try it. God's got it. He's going to take care of the, that situation. Your submission to him is important because, you're, because of your perspective. See, when I finally submitted to the Lord and I started serving the church and I started going out there and fellowshipping, I was reading my word and I was actually worshiping in spirit and in truth. My perspective changed. It was no longer... Oh, it's not going Okay, it was no longer that I was feeling frustrated with life. I didn't have those same goals that I used to have. Things started changing. Even my physical perception of things started changing. I'll never forget, I was a shadow for um, children and resource. And I was walking one day to the third, third grade, fourth grade wing. And we, we were out in the middle of, we called the monte, there was a, there was Monte. I don't know. That is in English. Uh, there was trees. There was trees, but it was dead trees because it was like it's, uh, uh, Texas, and Texas is dry. So at the school, the trees in between the hallways were flourishing. 
and this giant gust of wind just came through, right through the breezeway of the, the third and fourth grade wing. And I just felt that breeze on my face. And then I looked up at the trees and I'll never forget how the leaves just sounded like they were clapping. It was like a, a roar of applause. And the leaves were green, but they weren't just like a, the crayon green. They were all just waving the air, clapping for the Lord in their bright green color of life. <clears throat> and I didn't hear the Lord speak, but I knew that creation was crying out to him. You know, this picture doesn't do it justice. That's the Grand Canyon. That's the Grand Canyon at sunset. My husband wanted to take me at sunset. I took this picture. It is breathtaking. It is absolutely breathtaking. You stand on that edge of the rocks and that breeze from the bottom of the canyon comes and it blows up at you. And then you see the sun hit those rocks, those layers of sediment from over time that God created over the thousands of years or whoever, however long the earth is uh, aged is gorgeous and all i could think is how great is our god yes, <laughs> change you change your perspective focus on jesus things will change your eyes will tell you different your ears will tell you different because now the spirit of the lord is guiding you and your your the way you you touch things like your hands you know the textures the way you appreciate people even in their quirks um so after my perspective changed i had new missions i had new goals i had my prayer group i was singing for the lord and then the lord started teaching me daily he was teaching me the message of the cross we were going through the the that passage where Isaac, um, where Abraham was taking Isaac up to the mountain to be sacrificed. And um, I, when they talk about the wood that, that Isaac threw in his back, I was like, that was just like Jesus. And they walked up the mountain. And I'm like, that's just like Jesus walking to Calvary. He knew he had to go. Isaac was a kid. He wasn't a dumb kid. He knew what was happening. And then the ram in the thicket, a ram is an adult male lamb. And I said, Lord, that's Jesus too. I, it changed my perspective of the Bible. Everything was changing for me once I started to submit to him daily. Um, so Psalms 51 6 says, Behold, you desire the truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in um, the secret heart. The, do the Lord was teaching me, and it was gradual, progressive teaching. And then one message turned to another message, and then the message of the week that the Lord was teaching me was focused on Jesus again and how to change my perspective in life. It was becoming something that was so clear, and I was like, The Lord. The Lord is still with me. Yes, amen. Even after I turned my back and I was seeking worldly things, the Lord brought me back to him and I found pleasure in him. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalms 91, 1. All you have to do is look up. Look at that sky. Look at the sky at dusk. You're going to see the proclamation of the Lord. If you can't praise, look at outside, look at the trees, look at the grass, look at the creation of God. It'll inspire you to praise the Lord because creation is praising the Lord. It's groaning for him, just like we should groan for him. So I had a breakthrough and a step forward. I wanted what God wanted. I wanted what God wanted. I wanted him to do with me what he wanted. I was finally able to come to a point where I was really seeking the Lord. I was really looking to please him and I wanted every opportunity to worship. I wanted the Lord that I to know that I loved him with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength. 
because my heart was his now. God took my heart and I made it his. It was always his. Since I was 12 years old, I gave it to him. Um, he took my soul. He was changing my thinking. He was making me see creation for what it was, which was a proclamation of God's glory. He took my strength. And even if I didn't want to every Friday teach those tired teachers about who Jesus was, I still did it. And eventually that inspired other teachers to start teaching. I'll never forget. You know, it was such a success, the prayer group. I'll never forget one day, my friend Nancy had asked to leave the group. She was a pastor's daughter and she admitted the same thing. She had lost sight of the Lord because of her issues. And I said, okay, go ahead. I was so happy that she was inspired to do something new for Jesus. I was thrilled. She had a presentation, she had a video, she had flyers that she walked around the whole school, invited all the teachers and the student teachers. And then the principal was there. And then the assistant principal was there. And then her secretary was there. All of these people are Catholic. And they showed up to our Christian Bible study now. <coughs> and the room was easily filled with 40 people in one kindergarten class, <coughs> adults, sitting in these little kindergarten chairs. And I'll never forget her talking and explaining the things of God. And it was like all the other sounds shut off. And I heard, aren't you jealous? Aren't you jealous that she got all these people here? Your boss is here. Your friend who you tried to get here a million times, she's here. All the, the Catholic teachers are here. The student teachers are here. She's done more than you. And I realized what was happening. The enemy was trying to spark jealousy in me. And I said, no. <clears throat> You're not robbing me of seeing God's glory in this. It's God's glory when you start changing your perspective and it affects other people. We have to affect other people by fellowshipping with one another, serving one another. It has to cause an effect. If you're doing it in spirit and in truth, if you're really focusing on the Lord and what He wants, if you really submit and let go it's what He wants, then it's going to have an effect on people. And the enemy's going to come after you like He did me. I'll never forget. I'll never forget that voice. But even in all that, those ideas, those wants of marriage and family and success and higher education, um, they kind of still linger. Sometimes even in our Christian culture, people still ask questions. When do you get married? When do you have babies? When do you need a new car? Do you, are you really satisfied with your home? But that's not right. That's not how we edify each other. That's why our fellowship needs to expand to others. Because where one Christian may have a different perspective about what you should be, another Christian has a biblical perspective about what you should be. And we should never snub the other one because you can still have an effect on that person. But you do need the edification of the person who has that biblical perspective in your life. I'll always thank my, I'm going to get emotional. I'll always thank the Lord for the friendships that I have here. <clears throat> I'll never forget the day that, that I actually spoke to Sabrina. We connected instantly and I knew we'd be friends, but I didn't know she'd be my best friend. Thank you so much. So God wants us to totally rely on him. So we can have an effect on other people. <laughs> and everything else is material. He wants us in his will for his purpose. When you have an effect on people, it's for his purpose. So that person can have an effect on people and they can serve his purpose. Second Timothy 6.6 6 says, But godliness um, with contentment is great gain. For we bought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. 
but we can take we our relationships with like with our fellowship is going with us because we all partake in the same spirit um so walking in god's will we need to commune with god we were designed to walk with him he designed us in the garden to walk with him step by step to commune with him um, that's what the enemy wants to take away from you, is your, com your community with God and other like-minded people. Anything can tempt you when you're not in that community. Communing with him at work, seeing praises to him out loud at work, uh, with your family, your unbelieving family, just commune with him because it's going to have an effect. I'll never forget when one day my coworker came out, and she always has a few choice words for a few choice situations all the time. And she was having trouble with a problem and she came out and she, she said, praise Jesus. And never heard her say praise Jesus before. She's the loudest person in the building. We got high ceilings and she said, praise Jesus, I found a problem. This was a, <laughs> never mind, I'm not gonna say anymore because you know, her daughters might be watching. <laughs> so commune with him. Uh, Commune with him in every moment that you can. Um, what the Lord wanted from me. One day I was praying in my bedroom. And, uh, can you sit still? Okay. <laughs> praying with the Lord and I was having a conversation with the Lord. And I don't have conversations where I can hear his audible voice, but I know what he's saying to me. And I said, Lord, I want more from you. I want you to take me where I need to go. I need to go to the next level. And then he stopped me there and he said, if I didn't give you all the things that you desire, marriage, kids, a car, success, a title, an education, would you still serve me? And without hesitation, I said, of course. I was like, God, what are you thinking? Of course, I'm talking to you right now. And he said, all right, get ready. Psalm 31, 14 through 15, but trust in you, O Lord. I said, you are my God and my times are in your hand. I placed, now I placed my time in his hand. You know, our time is precious. The stuff that belongs to us in time, you know, your time at work, everything that we do in life is clocked by time. We need to hand every moment over to him because it's precious. My time is now his time he took my empty heart and he made it whole it was always his time once that said that but i needed to surrender to him and he needed to know that i had a commitment um to him and that was my conversation um after this prayer i became even more committed to the lord i had a desire to serve him because i, well, I if i served him I would be filling my time with God and what he has called us to do, which is the Great Commission, and tell people about him. You know, I consider myself a jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> this kid gets after me when I say master of none. Um, it, was a, it was a goal that I had that I made in the flesh, and it just came to fruition. I can do a bunch of artsy-fartsy things. Um, but... I said, Lord, even that is yours. And my dad has always had a saying. My dad says, he just wants someone to stand there and show himself mighty through. That's his name, Arnold Colossi, D-A-D. He just wants someone to stand there and show himself mighty through. It's not about us, it's not about fleshy desires, it's not about who we are as people. Because once you surrender who you are to him, he's going to do so many things, but he wants to have the glory. You can partake in it. Don't worry. It's just his. It's always been his. From the moment you said, I surrender to you, Lord, I want you in my heart. Make my heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Titus 3, 5 says he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by washing of regeneration and the renewal of spirit. It's not by works. Amen. Here's another dad story. Um, my dad worked for a ministry. 
they had traveled to South America. And he was asked by my pastor at the time to go with him to Ecuador. But at the time, we didn't have the funds to fly my dad all the way to another country. So he turned it down. Later on in prayer, the Lord told him, you need to call Pastor Pat back. Pastor Pat, that was the name of my pastor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and tell him you're going to go. And he said, but Lord, I don't have a plane ticket. I don't have money for a plane ticket. He said, tell him to go, that you're going to go. So he called him back. He said, I'm going to go. So he packs his bags because he's going to Ecuador now. And then he goes to the airport. Pardon me. Allergies. And um, mind you, he has no money. He has a plane ticket. He has no money to go to Ecuador. And then he's told that his hotel is paid, the food is paid, everything's paid. Praise God. Yeah. But one of the church members uh, from our church at the time knew he was going to be at the airport. And he approached him with this envelope and he said, here, I want you to take this. And he took the envelope and stuck it in his jacket pocket. So he gets on the, the plane, they go to Ecuador, they have a wonderful time ministering. And then they come up to this pastor who was talking about building a church. And the Lord said, take the envelope out of your pocket and give it to him. He took the envelope out and he gave it to him. And then they went on their merry way. And um, the Pastor Pat called my dad and said, what did you do? He said, what do you mean what I did? He said, what was in that envelope? He said, I have no idea. He said, what do you mean? You didn't open the envelope? He said, God didn't tell me to open the envelope. <clears throat> he left the envelope closed. He said, in that envelope was enough, more than enough for that pastor to start his church. Wow. The Lord had moved and my dad was the instrument and God showed himself mighty and strong to those people in Ecuador. The Lord wants somebody to just stand there and show themselves mighty. He wants to move your heart, but he wants you to be sensitive enough to hear his voice, even to the point where you don't open the envelope. Because yeah. had he opened that envelope and saw all that money in there, what do you think he would have done? Right. We are tempted. We're just people Amen. with the spirit of God living in us, but we're still people. He's gonna love it, I told that story. I hope you're watching that. <laughs> <clears throat> so the turning point in my life, shortly after I told the Lord that I wanted to be taken to the next level, I got this message from a man in Louisiana. <laughs> a man that I met about 14 years before that. Uh, in Bible school, he was painfully shy. <laughs> um, there were confirmations about our betrothal all around, but I still believed it was a distraction because there many been counterfeit distractions before, just like those counterfeit doors. Yeah. You don't want to step in front of any old door because it's like a Walmart door. Mm -hmm. That's when I left my job and I volunteered my time at a wonderful ministry in Southmost Brownsville called El Prairie Nevada. And Southmost is a dangerous place. But God still called me there. My dad said, lock away your doors, don't open your doors, don't stop at the convenience store, make sure you have gas in your car so you can get there and back. I still did it. I went into that outcry in Barrio thinking that Barrio, I'm gonna give Shane when I get a phone call from my parents, Barrio, outcry in the Barrio. Um, thinking that I knew more Bible than those people that they pulled out from the dumpsters and the alleys and they were ministering to the Lord. And the Lord was revealing to me things that were crazy. We participated in praise and worship with no instruments, but the presence of God was there. It was loud and it was booming. All the neighbors heard, we were out in the boonies and it was awesome. See, when I told you that, that God was gonna show you wonderful things, he was gonna change your perspective. We don't need instruments to praise God. He wants your heart and he wants your submission to do it. Amen. So Amen. when we're up here praising with the instruments and no drummer, still praise him anyway. 
because there's a group of 40 or 50 men out in Brownsville Southmost for praising the Lord day and night with no instruments and the Lord his presence is still there don't think it's here there's a few people here but <laughs> there's always been a few people that God moves through there was only three Hebrew boys that stayed standing when they were demanded to bow but there was four to five there was only one Israelite boy who stepped up to slay the giant when there was an army standing right behind him. <laughs> they, they, God can do a few, a lot of things with a few people. We're more than a few. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid of our size. Mm. <sighs> the Lord was teaching me how to live in him. And I ended up in South Louisiana. <laughs> um, let's see. I think I got lost. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If Jesus served, we must serve. Amen. If Jesus served, we must serve. He even served the one who betrayed him. Wow, that's right. He washed his feet, which is one of the most filthy things to do for a person. Mm. And he did it for his betrayer. We go to work and we have bad attitudes with our co co-workers because, you know, they're terrible sometimes. We have bad attitudes with our customers because they're also terrible sometimes. But they didn't do to you what Judas did to Jesus. Our attitudes must change. There's no condition to God's love. And we carry that with us. So there should be no condition to how you express God's love to the unlovely. My new perspective when I came here, I was missing my family and my friends and my culture and my food. The tacos that I had easy access to, different varieties and sizes. I longed for my own culture, I longed for the music, I longed for the language. But the Lord reminded me that when I surrendered my life to Him, I therefore forfeited everything that was about me. Even the culture that I identified with, because now I identify with a new culture. I identify with those three Hebrew boys. I identify with the boy with the slingshot. I identified with the Queen Esther. I identify with the disciple who betrayed him. Mm. Peter ran. Are you going to run? And don't say no because he didn't think so either. Right. Romans 12, 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed to the renewal of your mind by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Your perspective has to change. You have to let him take over. Just let him. Just let him overtake your life. Trust me, it'll work. You can practice. When, you, when you're driving down the high, you're like, God, should I turn this way? And he'll tell you. Not in an audible voice. We'll just have that little inkling. I shouldn't turn there. I surrendered my life. I gave my heart. It's similar to when my dad surrendered his heart and my mom surrendered hers. My dad was gonna throw himself off a bridge. My mom too, because they couldn't handle. <clears throat> and the Lord in an audible voice spoke to my dad and said, stop, you don't want your life? Give your life to me. Mm. Wow. Let me wow. do with it as I will. And that was the catalyst that changed our family. Yes, we had hard times. There were things that we didn't desire to go through, but we went through them together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because when I was saved, I became a brother, a sister to my dad in Christ. We were part of our own little family fellowship. That's why it's important because your families become part of the fellowship. It was 
so different. The, that church in Ecuador may have not get, gotten started or God may have used someone else. Do you want to run the risk of God using someone else in your place? Or do you want to be part of the glory of God? We have to remind ourselves that we're on a bigger mission than just making our lives better. It's for the, the eternal salvation of somebody else. It's life or death for somebody else, not just ourselves. Creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Renew a right spirit with my coworker. Renew a right spirit with my aunt or uncle who's not saved, or my cousin who's not saved. That's for everybody. You didn't just select somebody. My new perspective uh, was to just let him take over. Mm. Just let him. <sighs> so I'm in a time of stretching. The Lord is stretching me in a mighty way here. I went from one rich culture to another rich culture where we ate cow's tongue and now we're eating Buddha and crap over here. <laughs> By the way, cow's tongue is great. He took me way out of my comfort zone. I almost had to learn a new language. Uh huh. Take me to the next level and marriage was my next level. If you don't think that marriage is the next level as a Christian, then you're not really married as a Christian. It's a time of testing, but it's also a time of blessing. Amen. When you marry who God has told you to marry, I have no words. Yeah, my husband is aggravated, but I think he's hilarious. I'm sorry, guys. I take enjoyment when you have the right people. <laughs> and if you're not in a godly marriage right now, just do what God tells you to do. He'll, he'll fix it. Just leave it all to the Lord, and he will fix it. Be obedient to him and his will. The Lord is not some cosmic chess master. I had this conversation with, with Matt, and I said, you know, God is not some cosmic chess master moving us around like pawns. God is teaching us how to play the game. This life, this life that's surrounded by worldliness and secularism and ungodliness is just a game to the enemy. And God is going to show you how to maneuver it, but you just got to trust in him. Even when you don't understand the situation, you got to trust in him. I have been wanting a promotion for about a year now. And I struggle with my job, and there were some people that I struggled with, but I did what the Lord told me to do. And I sought counsel, and I had friends and family members that told me just, just wait on the Lord, and I did. It wasn't without a little groaning and a repentance, <laughs> uh, but I did. And last year, when I asked my boss to, to allow me to get a promotion, because we can do that, and groom me for a new promotion, it, there just, things happened. It was events that just went from here to here to here. There was just no, no way for me to even try. But God restructured the company to force my boss and force his boss's boss to give me a promotion. He restructured the entire company, not just for me, but probably for other frustrated people. I got my promotion which come with responsibilities, praise God, but I get to talk to people about the Lord a little bit more. He doesn't just fulfill your needs. He goes above and beyond your needs and fulfills those and makes you realize that you didn't know that you really wanted what he gave you. And you're just so thankful that he gave it to you. God does things. You know, Nihilus says, look at God, look at God, look at God. Every day, look at God. There's so many things to look at to look at God. There's beautiful um, creation around you to look at God and remind you that he's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. He's marvelous. And he's our heavenly counselor. Always. He speaks to you. He does speak to you. You just got to open your spiritual ears. Yeah. And sometimes you got to open your physical ears. 
Clean them out. You have to be, you have to submit and you have to serve. So how much do we have to do um, to submit to him? It's 100%. 100%. All that you are, all that you need, all that you're after. You have to commit to him. We have You gave your empty heart to him. He's going to equip you to give you a promotion. There's nothing that you have that he can't use. Anything that he's built in you, the skills that you have, he can use it. My jack of all trades, I used it. I use it all the time. And then he gives us assignments. Sometimes we set our own stipulation, but if you're really submitting to God, if we really obey God, if we really want him to work in our lives, like have a strong desire, he's gonna override those stipulations that you have in place. I can't be around these people because I'm antisocial. I can't be around this person because we have a past. Um, my coworker has a bad attitude. That person has a bad attitude. Their, their kids are loud and noisy and I can't be around that. I just don't like the food that they serve. Like, you know, I don't like the restaurant that the ladies picked to go eat at. That's not a reason. God's gonna override you. And he's gonna find a way to do it. Um, I, I am going to make a confession. I, and this is all for the glory of God. There's this obnoxious customer that we have. Comes around, he's very loud, and he spits when he talks. But somehow, God has put a soft spot in my heart for him. He's, he's funny. And one day, when the pandemic was, you know, rampant, people were out buying up all the, the sanitizing materials. I was just looking for some alcohol. And he rides up in the drive-thru, and he says, hey, Miss Eva. He said, I went, he tells me all about his day. He went, he bought a can of Lysol and a whole bunch of hand sanitizers. And I said, well, I said, if you um, just keep your eye out for some alcohol, and I'm just looking for some rubbing alcohol. And then this other, uh, at the same time, one of our other obnoxious customers. Like, <laughs> but my attitude towards her was different. Like, oh Lord. She just sits there, she plucks her eyebrows in the drive through while there's 20 cars waiting to come in. She takes so long to look through her purse for things. And then she has like 15 transactions that I need to perform for her right there and then in the drive-thru. I cannot handle her right now. Even when she drove up, I audibly was like, oh Lord. And my coworker with the bad attitude said the same thing. But I was really nice to the, to the other guy. So they both drove off. And about 15 minutes later, the woman comes back and my coworker sticks the drawer out and they clunk inside the drawer and she pulls it back in. The woman had been listening to my conversation with the gentleman about rubbing alcohol. Wow. She brought me a bottle of alcohol. Wow. She went to the Dollar Tree after hearing our conversation I knew that there was alcohol at the Dollar Tree and brought me a bottle of alcohol. Wow. She doesn't know that I had bad attitude about her presence. And as soon as I saw the alcohol, I was stunned, the rubbing alcohol. And I said, oh Lord, forgive me, out loud. That is not my job as a Christian, to roll my eyes at people because they're obnoxious. And I said, I was, the Lord says you were fair to the other obnoxious one, but you weren't fair to her, even in your mind. Mm -hmm. The Lord is fair to his people, to his creation, and we should be too. Mm -hmm. I was convicted from that point on, and I'm glad my coworker heard the whole situation mm -hmm. because her perspective about me changed as well. I was a human being. I wasn't some goody two shoes at work like they thought. Right. <laughs> you know, the Lord has called us to serve. And um, I'll never forget a moment here at this church where I served. 
it was for, for Angie's bridal shower. There were so many things that happened for her shower. I'm so glad I did it. And I knew, I didn't know if anyone was doing it. I'm like, we gotta do it because we have to give honor where honor is due. She's done so much for our church. She gives and she was committed to us. She is committed to us. She's turned our lives around. I know our numbers have not gone up. She has. I got to know my new friend, Jen. And her awesome husband, Rich. And their doggy, Georgie. <laughs> we have things in common. Um, it was a chance of a lifetime. I just want to honor Angie, please bring her out. She's dedicated to the Lord and she's a servant of the Lord. She knows the word and she's going to a much bigger church. And although that there's a lot of people there, I'm sure she's not going to be lost in the crowd. She's done so much for us. So if everyone can stand, let's give Miss Angie a round of applause. Father God, that there's going to be more lives that are going to be touched, Father God. And more 
more people to come into our family, Lord, to have more brothers and sisters so that we may worship you at all eternity in heaven, Father God, all because of one obedient servant. We thank you, Father God, for her submission to you, because you are mighty, and you are worthy of all praise, Lord Jesus. We thank you for Angie and her gifts that you have blessed us with the time that we've had with her. We praise you and we honor you in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much.